you have your Bibles open to the book of Isaiah this morning, Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a Christmas series called He Shall Be Called. He Shall Be Called. And this passage is used uh, famously throughout Christmas, and uh, this, you know, I'll talk about all the interpretation of it and stuff in a moment. But let's, anyhow, let's read two verses here. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with just judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Everyone's can say amen. Now, I want to pick out certain parts and pieces of this and walk through the context and kind of lay the groundwork this morning as we begin this series. But I'm, I'm really just going to take four terms from this and preach on them uh, for the next four weeks. And if you're reading a King James Bible, I'm reading a new King James, which is in the King James tradition and the tradition of the Texas Receptus. And so it separates the terms wonderful and counselor but if you're reading a newer translation uh, more modern scholarship like NASB, NIV, ESV, New Revised Standard uh, something like that it'll combine those two terms wonderful and counselor without a comma so that's what I'm going with the modern scholarship and I'm gonna deal with it like this wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace let's say those together Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. What beautiful terms these are. Amen? What beautiful terms. Three ways of looking at this text. First of all, this text deals with King Hezekiah. And I'll explain that in a moment. A lot of Jewish scholars believe that it dealt with the coming of King Hezekiah, who was the next king to come in the secession of kings in the line of Judah as Isaiah was prophesying to those kings Uzziah and Ahaz and Hezekiah those were kings in during Isaiah's time so it's only Hezekiah that's the way the Jews see this passage or some Christian scholars believe it's only dealing with Jesus the coming of the ultimate Messiah the ideal king of the line of David and it's only dealing with Jesus then there are other scholars that believe it deals with both and I'm going to take that option I believe the passage possibly deals with both Hezekiah and Jesus and you say how can that happen because sometimes in Old Testament prophetic uh, scripture there are dual fulfillments of those prophecies amen so when Hezekiah or when Isaiah prophesied this to Ahaz he could have been speaking about the coming of Hezekiah who was coming next however there was a greater an ultimate fulfillment of that prophetic word that was coming and would be fulfilled in Jesus centuries and centuries later so hang with me just for a couple moments and let me lay the groundwork for the context of what's going on here first of all the nation of Israel in this passage Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Israel who are in Judah at this time the kingdom had been divided After the days of Solomon, the kingdom was divided between northern Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Isaiah was prophesying to Judah. And what was happening was there was an impending doom coming to Judah. The Assyrians, the great Assyrian empire, was breathing down their necks and was ready to come and wipe them out. But what happens is that Judah had a very wicked king at this time. His name was Ahaz. Ahaz was so wicked, he defiled the temple of God. He set up high places of worship to idol gods all throughout the nation. And he was just a very, very wicked king. And so the the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, came to Ahaz. And they said, hey man, would you join in covenant with us and help us stand against the Assyrians? Isaiah goes to him as a prophet. And Isaiah says, do it. Trust the Lord. I don't care how big and bad the Assyrians are. Trust the Lord, and the Lord will will be on your side. But Ahaz being wicked, he didn't do that. Instead, he came in covenant with the Assyrians. 
And so what happened? The Assyrians came to northern Israel and wiped them out and took them captive. 722 B.C., they're taken captive to Assyria. And so Ahaz really aided and abetted the destruction of his brothers to the north. So what happens? At this time, Isaiah stands up in the midst of this turmoil and conflict, in the midst of, of this rule of this wicked king, and he says, you know what? A child's going to be born. Even in Isaiah chapter 7, you see that. 7.14 That a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. This will be a sign to you. Ahaz said, I don't need a sign. Isaiah said, pray for a sign. Ahaz said, I don't need a sign. Isaiah said, fine, God's going to give you one anyhow. Here's going to be the sign. A child's going to be born. And here's what the child's going to do. And it's a powerful chapter if you read that whole chapter. So in the midst of that historical context, we see God drop this huge prophetic word that a son is coming who's going to rule righteously. A son is coming who is going to embody all of these characteristics. First of all, it's seen maybe in type and shadow in Hezekiah, but then it's ultimately seen in Jesus. Can everybody say amen? So when Hezekiah comes, he's a really good king. He cleans up the house of the Lord. He reestablishes the priesthood. He tears down all the idle places of worship in the land of Judah. And God blesses him. God blesses him so much that the enemies come against him at one point and they totally encamp the city. And what does he do? He prays. The Bible said he set his face to pray. He went and prayed and an angel came down and wiped out all the captains of his enemies. How many can raise your hand and say it pays to trust God and not our fears? That's a sermon right there. Raise the other hand. <laughs> it pays to trust God and not our fears. So what happens? This word is given. A son is coming. A child will be born. Now, ultimate fulfillment of this was in the days of Mary and Joseph, Roman Empire, Jesus came to earth, and He was the ultimate Davidic King. He was the Messiah that all of Israel had been waiting on. But He would come and rule not only over the people of Judah or the line of David, but He would come and eventually rule over all humanity. Right now it's spiritual, but after a while it's going to be physical. And He's coming and He will rule and be all of these things ultimately to the entire earth. But right now, spiritually, He is all of these things to us. Can you say amen? He is our wonderful counselor. He is our wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God in valor. He is our Father and He is the Prince of Peace. These are all attributes of God. Counsel, valor, fatherhood, and kingship all are found in God Himself. The Net Bible, which is an interesting Bible you can find online. It's a, it's a collection of like thousands of scholars that put their textual notes in there. But the Net Bible translates this term, wonderful counselor, like this. Amazing advisor or extraordinary strategist. Amazing advisor or extraordinary strategist. So I just want us just for the next few moments to drill down on this term, wonderful counselor, amazing advisor, extraordinary strategist. Somebody, somebody say, he is my wonderful counselor. What does it mean that he's our counselor? I'm going to give you some very simple things this morning and just preach a simple gospel message, but sometimes beauty is in the simplicity, right? First thing it means to me is that it means that he knows what I need. Wonderful counselor means he knows what I need. Earthly counselors may be able to help you, and we have some very good ones, and even pastoral counseling. We can help to some extent. But you know, when you come to us, we're always limited at some point. We're always limited in knowledge, 
if you came to me, I would have a limited knowledge of, of your life, and I definitely wouldn't know the interior of your life. I don't know what you're thinking and your heart and your emotions and your past and your history. And I, don't, I don't know all that stuff. But when we come to the wonderful counselor, he knows everything about us. Matter of fact, Jesus said every hair on our head is numbered. He knows every sparrow that falls. He knows all of our wants, desires, and hopes and dreams. He knows those things that have, that have not come to pass, those things that have come to pass. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, your Father knows the things you need before you even ask. So when we go to prayer, we are to go to prayer and we are to ask Him things in prayer. But the beauty part of it is when we ask God something in prayer, He already knows we're going to ask it. Because He already knows every need we have in our lives. And it's beautiful because He knows my complete past. He knows my history. Amen? He knows everything I've done, everything that I've failed at, everything I succeeded at. He knows all the sin. He knows all the hurt. He knows all the things that didn't come to pass. He knows the disappointments. He knows the joys and successes. He was there at every birthday party. He was there at the weekend at the lake and down at the beach in the holiday. He was there with you through it all. Yet the beautiful thing is, if you've come to Him in faith and trusted Him as your Savior, He said He's taken all of those sins of your past and He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. That means it's a poetic way of saying they're gone and they're gone forever and they're gone for good. Hallelujah. No need us bringing up the past failures and the past sins because as far as God is concerned, they're completely gone. Now, you may not agree with me, and it's, hey, that's your prerogative. But Jackie and I, we entered into marriage. We, you know, we knew our history and we talked about that. But getting into like all of the junk of our past and everything we did wrong in high school, we never talked about it. And we've been married 26 years and still haven't. And we're happy about it. Listen, no, I want to know every detail. Well, maybe that's how you are. We weren't like that. We said what's under the blood is gone, man. What's forgiven is forgotten. And I'm not going up digging up a bunch of stuff in my past to have to deal with every time we sit down to eat dinner. I'm going to go preach behind the wall. Hallelujah. No, come on, do we believe the Bible or not? How many believes that when He forgives you, it's gone and it's under the blood and it's washed away? Can you shout amen? Thank God for that. So when we come to the, the wonderful counselor, He says, yes, Hans, I know your sin. And oh yeah, by the way, I've done away with all of them. So I believe I could go to heaven today and like get on Google search for heaven only. And like research the tomes and volumes and records of heaven. And I believe if I went looking for my sins, I believe the search would show up with zero responses. Now I remember it, others remember it, but you know what? The wonderful counselor has already moved on and dealt with it. And by his prerogative, he has decided to cast it completely away. Somebody should shout amen at all that. You know what? He knows our present. He knows, he knows where we are right now. Some of you are going into Christmas season and maybe you feel that anxiety, that loneliness. It's often one of the loneliest seasons of the year because people think about how they used to be with family or they should be with this person or that one. You know, uh, I will have a blue Christmas without you, Elvis Presley. Maybe you have that. I grew up listening to Elvis at Christmas every year. Hallelujah. But anyhow, I don't, you don't have to have a blue Christmas, right? Because He knows everything you're going through. He knows where you're sitting. He knows your emotions. He knows your fears. He knows your desires. He knows your vision. He knows your dreams. He knows the people around you. He knows who shouldn't be with you and who should be with you. He knows the doors you have open for you. He knows the doors that He shut for you. Come on. He knows everything about our lives. And the best thing of all is He holds our future and He knows our future as well. And when we pray and when we get prophetic words, it's often talking about the future. Why? Because God holds that in His hand and He's the master of my future. He's the commander of my salvation. Somebody shout amen. 
You could go to a palm reader or you could go to a witch or you could go to a, uh, a psychic. You shouldn't do that. It opens a door for spirits to come into your life. You shouldn't do that. But if you went to one, they might be able to talk about your past if they contacted demons because the demons know our past. But one thing they can't tell you is about your future. Because God only holds your future. Hallelujah. Even other people, we get counsel from people, and that's great, and the Bible instructs us to do that. But you know what? Other people don't know my future. They can do, we can do the best we can to counsel each other, but man, God knows my future. And when I tap into God and He gives me a, a glimpse of my future, a prophetic word or a picture of my future, I know it's a download from heaven, and that's something that's right on the money. Can you shout amen? So when Satan brings up your past, remind him of his future. Because I read the book, and it says in the end, that serpent, that dragon, Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever, and he'll never come back to tempt the people of God in the, in the final end. So I know my future as well. I'm going to be one of the blood one of the blood-washed throng, robed in white, with palm branches, singing the song of victory in heaven, surrounding the Lamb, the four and twenty elders, the flying cherubim. Come on, the four be We're going to be there in heaven as the victors. He's going to be the loser in the end. Can somebody shout amen? My wonderful counselor knows what I need. My wonderful counselor knows what I need. Not only that... He can help. My wonderful counselor can help me. You may come to me for counseling, and I, I, I hope I could help you, or maybe you go to another counselor, and, and I think they could help you probably, but there's always that possibility or that percentage chance that they can't help, or I can't help you. Why? Because I'm not God. But when we go to the wonderful counselor, it's a 100% chance He can help. Why? Because he's been through the fire and he's been tried and he's been proven. He's already gone through everything that we've been faced in life, everything that we've been tempted with. In all points he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin, the Bible says. He's been through that all. He's been tried and he's been proven. There's a scripture in John chapter 6 where Jesus is talking to all of those, that great multitude that was following him. And at one point he told them the hard sayings. He gave like these strong discipleship things. You know, if you want to follow me, uh, deny yourself. You must eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, all that stuff in this passage and the people turn around and leave him but yet here the disciples sat there and Jesus looked at the disciples and he said are you guys going to leave too and Peter said Lord where should we go you're the one who has the words of eternal life we've already tried you and already found out that you're the one who's in you have the answers to my life you're the one who knows how to deal with the evil in my heart. You're the one who knows my past, present, and future. You're the one who knows my thoughts, and you're the one who can speak to me the word, one word in season, and change my entire life. You're the one who can do that. Where else can I go? You've been tried, and you've been proven. Not only that, He invites us to try it. He said in Matthew, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Try me out. You've been taking the world stuff and it's wearing you out. Why don't you come try me? It's going to be easy because I'm going to take that yoke off of you of the world and you can follow me. I invite you to come and check it out. Even those of you who maybe have fallen away from the Lord. Maybe you came to church for a while or you went to church in years past and then you just got caught up with the things of the world and you've been doing your own thing, running your own path. And now you've come to the point where you said, man, I realize how far I've fallen away. And I realize how I used to be close. I'm not close like that anymore. I used to feel the presence of God a lot. I don't feel it like that a lot anymore. Well, you know what? You need to come home. And you're in the right place today to come home. Or online, you're watching the right program. Come on, you're in the right place to come home. Because the Bible says He's married to the backslider. He's after you. He's pursuing you. Isaiah said, oh, that you had heeded my commandments. 
I wished you would have listened to me the first time. Then your peace would have been like a river. And then your righteousness would have been like waves of the sea. If you would have just stayed the course. Because to turn your back on the Lord is to invite disaster in your life. Because He's the only one who can lead us in the correct path. Can somebody shout amen? And the final piece of this is, as the wonderful counselor, He's always available. He doesn't work 9 to 5. He doesn't work 8 to 4 and then goes home and watches gun smoke. He doesn't work just weekends. He doesn't work Monday through Friday only. No, God is on 24-7, 365, though He's technically outside of time. So He doesn't have to clock in and clock out. He created time. (laughs) And He's always in the eternal present. That's why He's called the I Am that I Am, who was, who is, who is to come. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so He's always on the clock and we can go to Him at any time and find help with Him. Hallelujah. You can go to a counselor today. They have certain hours. They have certain rate that they pay and and that's fine and dandy. But you know what? You have to go by their rules. Also, another, in, another way of talking about counseling, we're, I've mo- mainly been using it in the context of counseling. We, we share our heart with someone. They help us figure out what's in our heart and work toward a solution. That's beautiful. However, there's another way to use this term, and that is as an advocate because a lawyer is also called a counselor. There's a lawyer, counselor, advocate. And in that regard, he's trying to understand your problem so he can go fight for you or represent you y'all with me this morning so you got a counselor who listens to your problems and then tries to work through a solution and figure out the interior issues going on and then there's another counselor who figures out what's going on knows the law and then goes and fights or represents for you i need both I need someone I can call out that understands my heart, that gets on the inside and helps me find a solution. And then I also need an advocate that understands where I'm at and he can go fight for me in the courts of heaven. Hallelujah. And he can show up and be my mighty God, my extraordinary strategist in battle. Hallelujah. Amen. But you know something? In law work, there's often a really big price involved in legal work. So we know, man, you know, uh, we've had situations even uh, in the denomination and committees I've been on that if you get involved and call in a lawyer, they're very good. My brother's an attorney. Hallelujah. But if you call them in, you, you, you better get ready to pay the price because it's going to be expensive for their counsel because they're going to go fight for you, Right? However, when I read the Bible, my wonderful counselor charges nothing. Well, you should have shouted there. That was your opportunity. But you can come to him free. Hallelujah. You can come to him free and make your petitions and requests known. And guess what? He shows up without a retainer fee and shows up and starts fighting on your behalf, he already knows the law of God because he is the law of God. He already knows the loopholes in the law because he is the grace of God. And he's already agreed to help you because he is the mercy of God. My word. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. Amen. So, So if you don't have any money, you're in right place. Isaiah 55. Ho! That's a Christmas word. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you will and, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. And you who have no money, come, yes, buy, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? We spend money on so many crazy things. Why are we doing this? Some of these things often create more anxiety in our lives. Then we're worried about the bill. Then we're worried about the debt we just accrued. So we can look at that thing in the 
driveway. So, and, incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation. You who do not know and nations who do not know you shall run to you because the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel for he is glorified. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are my ways your ways says the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts God said come free to the wonderful counselor I've already figured out your life I already know the solutions for your life I've already wrote the book I've already got it printed, hallelujah, as the text for your future. Why don't you come? It doesn't cost money. It just costs your life. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a praise in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the middle of the night when anxiety is gripping you and you don't know how you're going to pay your bill. You don't know how you're going to get the water leak fixed. You don't know how the family's going to receive you at Christmas. You can lift up your hand right there laying on the pillow and call out to the wonderful counselor and say, God, Father, I need some help right now. I need some direction right now. And there's a peace that goes beyond understanding that can come and take a hold of your heart and make everything all right. And you can walk into the midst of a room of people who hate you you and you can walk in there like you've got a shield around you why because the Lord has already come and given you peace for your future and peace for your surroundings somebody shout amen he's a mighty warrior he's my refuge come on he's a God mighty in battle Isaiah said he is my rear reward that means the one who gets behind me and checks my back for me because you can walk into battle and you can see the front but you can't see the back but God says my glory shall be your rear reward because the wonderful counselor is coming to fight for you. He's coming to intercede for you. He's coming to make an argument in heaven for you. My God, I just feel like preaching. Somebody give him a shout this morning. Hallelujah. Yeah! High five three or four people around you. Say, are you alive? So there's three prayers, three simple prayers I'm going to give you right now. If you want to learn how to pray, here's, here's, a, here's a shot at it. Number one, you can say this, and the wonderful counselor responds. Lord, save me. Come on, say it with me. Lord, save me. When we talk about salvation, first of all, it does mean from sin. So we know we're saved from sin. Romans 10, 9, 10, if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord we are saved book of Acts whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved amen so we call upon the name of the Lord in faith and that belief that's in our heart becomes expressed through our mouth and God says salvation comes however the term salvation is greater than just you're saved from sin and your tickets punched for heaven the term salvation sozo in, in the original Greek means you know more about wholeness in life even expands to healing and to blessing over our life. That's why Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He comes that we may have full salvation, the wholeness and complete package of being saved. So maybe you already are a Christian, but you still need to cry out, Lord, save me. Do you remember the story of Peter? When Peter saw Jesus coming, the disciples were in a boat. They got in a terrible storm one night on the Sea of Galilee. And then all of a sudden, through the midst and fog of that storm and the waves, they saw Jesus walking on the water. Now one of the gospel writers said he was walking and would have passed them by. I'm like, was he just getting in his 10,000 steps or what was he doing? He was like, you more and I can eat an oatmeal cake once I get home. I, he was just like he's cruising on the water. And the disciples see him and they freak out because they believe in spirits coming on the water and they cry out. and, Lord, is that you? It is I. 
Jesus, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, then, then bid me come. Come. That's my best theatrical Shakespearean I got. And he steps out of the boat, and Peter walks, and he's just thinking about, I'm, I'm responding to what Jesus said, and he walked. Then all of a sudden he thinks, hey, I'm defying nature right now. I'm doing something that's completely impossible. Whoa. And then he looks at the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. But is that it for Peter? No, he prayed. And what did he pray? Lord, save me! And the Bible says Jesus stretched out his hand and pulled the guy out of the water, and then he got him in the boat and reamed them out. Why did you not believe? Isn't it amazing? In the book of Mark, chapter 16, when Jesus raises from the dead, He comes in the room and all the disciples are there and they're like, <laughs> He says, Why did you not believe what I said? Numerous times they're amped and He comes in and just knocks them out. Lord, there's another prayer and it's, Lord, forgive me. Let's say that one. Lord, forgive me. 1 John 1, 9, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous who forgives us of all sin. So whether you're born again and Christian in here today, or if you're not, this verse applies to you. You can come to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned. Would you please forgive me? And God responds to that prayer. And He takes that sin debt off of you and wipes it away third prayer that God hears is Lord give me peace come on let's say it in here Lord give me peace now I've heard this and I need to do more study on it but peace in Hebrew is Shalom if you go to Israel with us people will greet you with Shalom it's like hello good morning well it's not really good morning but it's hello right Shalom and Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace but I've heard it said that the original Hebrew kinda has this idea Things are now as they should be. I'm going to say shalom all the time now. I just convince myself. Things are now as they should be. Look at your neighbor and say shalom. But let's make it Carolina. Shalom, y'all. Okay. Things are now as they should be. Shalom has come. Oh, hallelujah. So when you don't have peace, maybe you're walking into this Christmas season with all kinds of anxiety. Come on, call on the shalom of God. Lord, give me peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Come on, let not your heart be troubled. I've got the future all taken care of. Let not your heart be troubled. Christmas is not going to kill you. <laughs> Just watch a few more of those crazy Hallmark movies and you'll be fine. I'm sorry, ladies. I, they're okay. But. Chris, come on, say it. Christmas is not going to kill me. Because it isn't about just trees and, and gifts and lights. Those are nice things. But it isn't about that. It's about a day when the wonderful Counselor came down from heaven. God in flesh took upon Him the form of a man and stepped out of glory, leaving aside His divine attributes. And He humbled Himself and went to the wrong side of the tracks, to Bethlehem. And He was born not even in a hotel, not even in a house. He was born in a cave where they kept the little animals. And He comes out, the King of glory, coming to bring peace to all men and goodwill on earth and his name shall be called ultimately Jesus which means salvation to all somebody give him a praise hallelujah thank you guys for watching or listening online today I pray this service was a great blessing to you you know the greatest question you'll ever be asked in your life is are you ready to meet the Lord are you serving the Lord with all of your heart you know, my main goal in preaching, my main goal in providing these online services is to see people accept Christ and come to a, a, a vibrant relationship with God. So right now, if you've never accepted Him into your heart, why don't you pray this prayer with me and ask Him in? 
It's that simple. You just say, Lord, come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. And God will make a dramatic change in your heart. And let's pray this right now. If you are ready to accept the Lord into your heart, you want to ask him in, just pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, come into my life. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I give you all of my sin, all of my past, and I pray you wash it away and make something beautiful of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. If you said that prayer, I believe God has come into your life and has done something amazing in your heart. Continue to follow us online. We would love to continue to be a blessing to you and your family.